Okay, okay let's go ahead and pray, pray. and then uh, we're going to head. Lord, thank you so much for a really great conference. And Lord, um, we just thank you for this opportunity this morning now to be able to talk a little bit about church history and Lord, um, just trying to understand what happened and Lord, what we can do about just seeing a, a new reformation. Lord. So I thank you and I just pray that you would minister to all of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, we're going to do a whole lot in the next uh, 45 minutes, and I'm really glad that Erwin Luther is here. I mean, I've, we've had a, we've known each other for a few years, and I've been able to give him a couple of Reformation tours in Geneva, but he's actually the Reformation expert, so I'm a little intimidated, okay? And you can correct me on anything, add, subtract, kick me out, no problem at all, okay? <laughs> but it's a real honor to have you right here, especially on the front row. So anyway, here we go. So when vision is crushed by history, um, as you know, maybe you don't know, um, I, I love this topic. I'm a church planner in Geneva, Switzerland, the city of John Calvin, which is actually where I was raised. And I love Reformation history because it oozes out of every cobblestone in Geneva. Anyone been to Geneva here besides Ruin Luzer? Okay, fantastic. By the way, I'm really glad that my son all of a sudden, John Glass, this really complicated in our house, is back there. So uh, he can also correct me since he could give Reformation to it probably better than I can. Totally not paying attention back here. Don't <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's actually working. He's always working. It's interesting. He does have an interesting job. So my, my question is really simple here. Okay, so what happened to Europe and to the vision of the Reformation sparked by Martin Luther, John Calvin, and so many others? Why did the Reformation pretty much end up dying in Europe. What happened? Well, in this session, we're going to see the, the reasons of the decline of the Reformation in Europe and to see what can be done about it. So I'd like to um, really divide our time into three parts. By the way, it's not really a sermon, okay? This is gonna be like Al Mohler said last night, I think he called it a conversation or a talk, but we're gonna end on the Bible, we always do, okay? But anyway, so I'm gonna, we're gonna do three things. We're gonna do the, the, first of all, the vision of the Reformation. Secondly, the demise of the Reformation. And thirdly, the resurgence of the Reformation. Okay, that's the plan. So let's start, first of all, um, with the vision of the Reformation. So this will be a PowerPoint presentation. When I do Reformation tours, and I do a lot of those in Geneva, I always start off in Calvin's Cathedral or St. Peter's Cathedral with a big iPad, and I show a bunch of pictures so people can sort of understand the story. That's what I'm going to do now. Just kind of quick give you. So if you were in Geneva, we were starting our Reformation tour. This is sort of the way I would start it, okay? So this was the state of the church in the, wait, you know what? I think I need to turn my internet off. Oh, or maybe not. Probably not. It's Zoom. Yeah. Oh, you can't see what I'm seeing. It's saying connecting. I think, uh, it's like it's. Okay, well, I think you're back now. So. I, I've got a big thing saying connecting right here, so okay. Oh. Unmute your speaker. Unmute your speaker. No, that's fine. Just leave it. Leave it muted. Okay, now uh, I see to... myself. I would share, Ooh, share your screen again. There's a lot of weird stuff going on here. You want to come and help me here? It's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful that Calvin didn't have this right. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? It's like, I'm looking good, though. We're not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, everybody, you're here. Thank you. The Lord provided. Okay. <laughs> So this was the state of the church in the Middle Ages. It was Catholic, it was big, it was wealthy, and it was corrupt. Now this thing's not working. Can you make this thing work? That's okay, I'll just go like this. That's not working either. Oh, we got a major problem here, okay? Sorry, folks watching on Zoom, okay? This is not working. Oh, there it goes. Okay. okay. How'd you do that? I just clicked on the, on that. Just clicked yeah. on the, <laughs> 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 just got a click, guys. Come on. Okay. So anyway, all right, let me click. Okay, so this was the state of the Catholic Church, okay? Very, very corrupt. And so the fundamental issue, I'm just making it really simple here, is this. The question was, how can a man be forgiven of his sins and go to heaven? That was the big question, Okay. Well, there was a guy called John Tetzel. He was a, a, a German monk, 
And he thought and was you know, promoted by the Pope to go and sell what they call indulgences. And it's a piece of paper you could buy. And with this indulgence, you could either go less time in purgatory. If you paid a lot, you could go right to heaven. Well, there was a guy called Martin Luther. Well, first of all, his famous phrase, uh, Tetzel's phrase was, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul out of purgatory springs. I like it in German. So about den Fenik in Kasten klinkt. Die Selle aus dem Verfug springt. I have no idea what that says, but it sounds really cool, okay? But anyway, so that was Tetzel's thing. Well, this is an actually 1825 indulgence that you can find in the Reformation Museum, okay? So this is 1825, it's the piece of paper you could buy. But look at this. This was in 2013, the Vatican offers time off purgatory to followers of the Pope Francis tweets at the Rio World Youth Day. They're still totally doing it today. Nothing has changed actually with the Catholic Church. Well, there was another monk, his name was Martin Luther and he was teaching theology. And one day he was reading the Bible, he was in Romans one and guess what? He hit Romans 117. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And so he thought, wait a minute, I don't think the Bible is really cool on indulgences. We are saved through, by, by, by faith alone. And so he, write out, he writes out 95 reasons why indulgences are bad. And that's called the 95 Thesis, which okay, is all about indulgences. And let me just give you a couple of examples. This is number 27. There is no divine authority for preaching that the soul flies out of the purgatory immediately when the money clinks in the bottom of the chest. In other words, eh, that's false, okay? Number 32, all those who believe themselves certain of their own salvation by means of letters of indulgence will be eternally damned together with their teachers. Well, pretty clear. Here's the gospel, verse 36. Any Christian whatsoever who is truly repentant, enjoys plenary remission from penalty and guilt, and this is given him without letters of indulgence. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen? amen. And then number 67, I like this one. The indulgences which the merchants extol as the greatest of favors are seen to be, in fact, a favorite means of money getting. Okay? So the bottom line is they were making a ton of dough. So Martin Luther writes his 95 Theses, nails them on the door of the church in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517. That's coming up real quick, guys. And then there's the Gutenberg Press. And so people start printing these 95 theses, but also portions of the Bible and the New Testament. And as these are getting printed, well, people are traveling through Europe and they literally take bags of these things and go all over Europe. Well, Geneva was one of the key cities of Geneva. And it was always been like today, we have the United Nations there. It was a city of fairs. They had four major world fairs there every year. People would come from all over Europe. And so these people would come from Germany and bring these 95 theses, bring the, the, the portions of the scriptures. And they would go down these streets. This is the Geneva Old Town, a perfect street, a, a typical street. They would go knock on doors and they would offer Bible studies in Geneva. This is how the gospel came to Geneva. Geneva was a small town of about uh, 10,000 people, 1,000 of which were priests and nuns. Very, very Catholic. Well, all these Protestants, a guy called William Farrell, he was a French guy, but totally saved. And he came to Geneva. He had won cities to Christ, actually. And he got kicked out of Geneva. So he had a friend called Antoine Fremont. And this is Fremont right here. And there's a very famous painting in a city square in Geneva called Le Molard. And you can still see that building today preaching. All that to say, the gospel was brought to Geneva by all these merchants and people. And all this led to the historic vote in May 21st, 1536. This is the historic vote where the entire city came together in Geneva and they literally voted May 21st, 1536. Catholicism is out. We are now a Protestant city. From that day on, Geneva has been officially Protestant. And meanwhile, well, there's a young guy, he's 14 years old. John Calvin is at the Collège of Montaigu here in Paris. Brilliant mind, and he's getting uh, first a theological degree, and then his dad felt that he should change into law because it made more money. So he ended up uh, studying law. But it was during his times of studies in Orléans in Paris that he came across his Lutheran ideas, Lutheran you know, Lutheranism, in other words, the gospel, and he got gloriously saved, 
And then he was tagged as an evangelical. It was illegal to be an evangelical in France. So he had to flee. He fled to Basel, France, uh, Basel, France, to Basel, Germany. And he was in Basel here. And he sat down and he thought, I got to write King Francis I of France and tell him that you're persecuting the wrong people. The evangelicals are good people. The Huguenots are good people. So he wrote a letter and he also wrote a book called The Institutes. Okay. And so he sent this to the king, thinking that the king would thank him for having, you know, put a little bit of, uh, uh, to, to explain the, 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 the gospel, well, that did not work at all. But anyway, the Institutes were out, and it was a bestseller, as he being explained what Christianity was all about. Well, one day, Farrell was in Geneva, now it was a Protestant city, and uh, Calvin came through town. And Farrell had already read the Institutes, and he thought, Calvin is the man for Geneva. This is a very famous scene where Farrell say, goes to Calvin's hotel room and he says to Calvin, I'm summarizing, John Calvin, if you do not hear the call of God to come to Geneva and preach the gospel, may God curse all of your studies. It worked. You should try it, okay? If you try to recruit someone, sure. it worked. Calvin said he felt like God would talk to him and he ended up staying for 25 years in Geneva preaching the gospel. And so he lived there. This is his house. I mean, so, so you know, a, a lithograph of where he used to live. You can see the cathedral on the left. So he lived right next to it. And um, if you go in Geneva, this is actually Calvin Street. On the left is where his home used to be. Now it's a new building. And there's a plaque there that explains where he uh, he lived. And you can see he'd go out of his house, take a left, go down. There's a fountain there. He'd drink, go all the way to the church. That was his office. Come back. He did that for 25 years. That, that was his room. Th th this was his life right here. This is the church, St. Peter's Cathedral. We call it Calvin's Cathedral. It didn't have the portico in front in those days. Well, a little different, but the inside is identical as it was in the days of Calvin. This is the inside of the church. A little lopsided. I don't know why there with that picture. But anyway, you can see his pulpit down there, down the aisle on the left. It's the same pulpit, new wood, but it's the exact replica of Calvin's pulpit. And as I tell people, I mean, this was a radical pulpit. From here, the Reformation spread in the teaching of John Calvin. And so this is a really great lithograph of John Calvin preaching from that pulpit. He preached every day, every other week. This guy's like a preaching machine. Just to let you know, he preached out of Isaiah. He was an expositor, word for word, out of Isaiah, 353 sermons. That is like a ton of sermons, okay? But you have to go to church in those days every day. It was required of all demons. So he just preached his heart out. Maybe that's why the Reformation happened, right? When you start preaching that much, something's going to happen. So anyway, this is the pulpit today. And often when people come, we sit down and I tell them all about Calvin's preaching right under the pulpit and let him get really blown out of the water, just inspired by Calvin, okay? And this is a cool shot. I took this in the pulpit looking to the right at the empty benches, but th this is the view he had from his pulpit, which is kind of fun. And this is a very famous scene where the... Um, the, uh, the um, just like on their names, the Libertines is a political party in Geneva. They felt you could be a Christian and have a mistress to make things simple. So they wanted to take communion four times a year. And they said to Calvin, Calvin, we want to take communion. He says, no way. Famous. He puts his arms out. He says, you can cut my hands and my arms off. I will not give what is holy to dogs. So he was pretty radical. So he got kicked out of Geneva. And so uh, after two years there, he got kicked out with Farrell. They left. He went to Strasbourg, met his wife, Idelette de Bure. She was a widow and said those were the best years of his life. He spent three years there uh, pastoring the Huguenots who were there in Strasbourg. And finally, Geneva called him back. And after three years, Geneva came back to Geneva and focused on three aspects of ministry in particular. First of all, preaching. Secondly, writing. Huge writer. And thirdly, teaching. And this is the Calvin Academy, which is still in Geneva. You can see the old and new picture of that to train children. This first city in the world where education for kids was made compulsory, but also to train pastors and later lawyers. Calvin's getting old, writing. Calvin is sold. He's got to be carried to church. Here he is being carried to church. And finally, he dies in 1564. Here's his uh, tomb today. He was actually buried in a common grave, but uh, Geneva decided to put a tomb there just to kind of mark the fact that he was actually in Geneva. But I want to show you this, the effects of the Reformation. So I'm just going to summarize this very, very quickly, of course. First of all, the doctrinal transformation. What did the Reformation bring? Well, you've heard of this, the five solos. The five solos are really a summary 
of what the Reformation did. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, solus Christus, Christ alone, and soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. No more glory to, 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 to saints or to Mary, just to God. And so that is really a summary, if you want, of what the Reformation did. Okay, it's a complete change. And this is kind of cool. There's also a societal transformation, societal transformation. As seen on the Reformation wall, there's a great wall that depicts the amazing effects of John Calvin and the Reformation around the world. And there it is, that's the old city and it's a 100 meter portion of the wall that's left there today and you can go and, and this is a, a picture of a group I'm giving, this is actually Mark Tesla group from the Masters. And, uh, and you're in part, part of just the center of the wall but it goes on both sides, it's a massive wall. And uh, this is to show you how small a person is when you're next to these massive statues. The guy, by the way, did this well is the same guy who did the big Jesus in Rio de Janeiro. Okay, mm -hmm. same guy. And so uh, if you one, one of the, there's eight murals that describes the effect of the Reformation in Germany, Holland, France, Switzerland, Scotland, America. That's the slide you're seeing there. That's the Mayflower arriving in America in Geneva, Switzerland. Isn't that cool? And then England and Hungary. So this is kind of stuff I explained. And finally, this is a great little book called The Legacy of John Calvin, His Influence on the Modern World by David Hall. He gives 10 effects or 10 results of the Reformation. I'm just going to read these, okay? Really interesting. Number one, broad-based education for all. Number two, care for the poor. Number three, the Protestant work ethic. Number four, freedom of the church to rule itself. Number five, check and balances of power and government. Number six, the process of elections. Number seven, the sacredness of ordinary work. Number eight, free market capitalism. Number nine, worship of the language of the people. And number 10, understanding the power of the media. Okay, so I went really fast. Let me just give you one example. If you go to number three, the Protestant work ethic, right? Protestants work hard. What's the deal? Where did that come from? This is interesting. What's that? When you see that, what do you think to yourself? Is that a good knife or is that a bad knife? Well, is it a good knife? Is it like the best knife in the world, basically? <laughs> no. But kind of, right? I mean, is it known to be quality when you see something Swiss? Yeah. What does Swiss mean? Quality, right? Okay, let's change. How about that? What, is that, what does that sound like? <laughs> okay, I, now, yeah, now you're catching my drift here, okay? Okay, I don't have one, but I do have one right here. What's this? It is. It's not Japanese. It's Swiss, okay? This is a Frédéric Constant of Geneva, Swiss watch. What do you know about Swiss watches? Good or bad? Good. Good. Isn't that interesting? Everything about Switzerland is actually good. Why? Calvin preached the Ten Commandments, but he preached the opposites, okay? Commandment number eight, thou shalt not steal. What's the opposite? Don't steal, which means you can keep what you have. How do you, how do you have what you have? By working. Fourth commandment, okay? You shall keep the Sabbath one day of the week. What do you do the other six days? Work, and you work hard. Bottom line, this is the Protestant work ethic. This is the result today that you see in Switzerland. Everything's quality. I think because of a preacher, super interesting, okay? Mm -hmm. And so all of those effects happened because of a preacher in Geneva, okay? The problem, I went really fast, okay? If that was the world-changing vision of the Reformation, what happened to it 500 years later? I mean, I was raised in Geneva. I didn't know about Calvin, I mean, I heard the name. I had no idea who the guy was mm -hmm. until I got saved in 19. So you can live in Geneva and have no clue about any of this stuff. You're going, there's something wrong there. What is the deal? What is the deal? <laughs> well, this is the next section. I'd like to talk about this, okay? We're going to talk about the demise of the Reformation, what happened, and then try and give you some solutions. So I'm going to talk a lot about France. Because remember that France surrounds Geneva on a map, which is why Geneva is French speaking today. Geneva was greatly influenced by France as a result. So I will sometimes talk about Europe, but I'm just really thinking about France and the French speaking world, you'll understand. So what happened when you come to France today, by the way, it's the number one tourist country in the world. People love France. It is a great place. I mean, think about it, Paris, Nice, Cannes, the Alps, the French Riviera, the English Channel, Normandy. You got the Eiffel Tower, the Arc of Triumph, the Champs Elysees, Notre Dame Cathedral, the Louvre, the Orsay Museum. You got ratatouille food. You got snails, frogs' legs. You got pâté de foie gras. You know that 
Paris has 17,000 restaurants in it. Wow. They love to eat there, man, big time, okay? And they even have the Michelin Guide. So France is wonderful, but it's got some major issues. Humanism and intellectualism and rationalism rule the country. Pessimism rules the emotions. France apparently is the number one consumer of antidepressants in the world. Wow. Moral decay is prevalent, sex is everywhere. Strikes are legendary, revealing anger and frustration with authority. There's massive rejection of all that is spiritual and a profound ignorance of the truth. There's churches everywhere, but they're empty. 2% practice out of the 96% that call themselves Catholics. 1% evangelical, 10% of France is Muslim. So you go, how can this be? When John Calvin, who was French, ministered in Geneva for 25 years, leading the Reformation. How can this happen? Well, that's what we're going to look at. There were basically four major events in France's history that caused the demise of the Reformation. Okay? And I'm generalizing again, but I'd like to show you these one at a time. Number one, what I'll just call the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation is a term used to describe the Catholic Church's attempt to reform itself in a way during the Reformation, but also in its desire to stop the reformers and win them back to the Catholic faith. Let me tell you about one guy, Francis de Sales, Francis of Sales. He was born in 1567 in France as a Catholic near Geneva. He had become a Protestant, I'm sorry, Geneva had become Protestant 31 years before in 1536, as I explained earlier, this guy had become a lawyer. It was while on horseback one day that his belt got unbuckled and his sword fell to the ground, coming out of its sheath. And when it fell to the ground, its sheath and its sword fell in a cross, and the sword was pointing right to him. Francis concluded that God wanted to put him aside as a priest. And that's exactly what he did. He became a priest in 1593. The Catholic Duke of Savoy gave him a task to convert 60,000 Calvinists back to Catholicism. For three years, this guy drudged through the countryside, had doors slammed in his face, rocks thrown at him. No one would listen to him until one day he had a bright idea. He said, I'm going to write my sermons on paper and slip them under the doors in the people's homes and see what happens. He became a hit overnight. People began to flock at this guy's sermons. That changed everything. Listen to this. By the time he left the area, it is said that he had converted 40,000 people back to the Catholic mm. faith. These are Calvinists back to the Catholic faith. He was eventually beatified and canonized by the Catholic Church. Now, I tell you that story because its story scares me. Yeah. It scares me. We must be theologically strong so as to be able to counter well-formulated and false truths that could derail believers from their faith. That's the number one of it that messed up the Reformation in a way, okay? And we have an enemy, right? It's just not going to let us just do things easy. Number two, second reason for the demise of the Reformation is what I would call simply the Protestant persecutions. Protestant persecutions. Once the Reformation was born in 1517, the, the Protestants multiplied at an incredible rate. It is estimated that in seven years between 1555 and 62, more than 2,000 Reformed churches were started in France. There were Protestants even in the king's court. In fact, there's a very famous thing called the Placard Affair. One day, the king saw a poster nailed on the door of his room, you know, bashing um, indulgences and, and, and really proclaiming the gospel. Well, he got really scared because now it became a direct threat to the king himself. And of course, they were denouncing the Catholic Church. And remember, the Catholic Church puts the king in the power. You know, they're the ones who, who anointed the kings to become kings. So this had to be stopped. So Protestants were persecuted, eventually massacred. Many began to flee the country. This picture is actually in 1702. I mean, they were like killing people, roasting them, eating them. I mean, it's like it was, it was, it was incredible. There's a room in the Reformation Museum 
dedicated to, to, the, to the tortures of, of, uh, of Protestants. I mean, it's unbelievable. It is incredible. And so many, of course, began to flee the country. It all came to a head in 1572, the day of infamy known as the St. Bartholomew's Massacre, when 10,000 Protestants were massacred in Paris in one day. Some of the cruelest persecutions that I just mentioned happened here in the Dragon. Louis XIV, he had a special army called the King's Dragons. And they were sent all around France to find Protestants. Either you recant or you die. And that's exactly what happened. So they fled, many fled to Holland, to South Africa, to Great Britain, to Ireland, to Prussia, to Germany, to Denmark, Sweden, Poland, even to Morocco. Many came to America, but many fled to Geneva. It was the closest free city there. John Calvin was, of course, the leading pastor. So what was in the impact of so many thousands of Protestants being killed and leaving the country? Well, there's an interesting book called The History of the Protestants in France, written by Charles Bus in French. It says this, quote, France under Louis XIV was by far the leading country in the world by its civilization. Versailles, after all, was being built. But when the Protestants refugees left, they took with them their literature, their way of life, and their industries. They completely transformed certain countries they fled to by pouring into these the resources of their know-how, felt hat, silk, manufacturing techniques, fine materials, sheets, dyes, paper, buttons, silk stockings, jewelry, watches, lace. All these things were produced first in France by Protestant entrepreneurs. The refugees were known to be hard workers, laborious men of character. They brought not only their hands, but also their souls, and they founded solid families. And as Bus says, all that the receiving countries gained, France lost. The majority of French industry was ruined. So what impact does that have on France today? France has been, quote, spiritually and financially bankrupted by the absence of Protestants. And this is interesting, the moral fiber of the country has been ruined. And you know what the ultimate symbol of that is? This is shocking to most Americans. Go to a French beach, all the women walk around topless and nude. It's totally okay. No moral fiber. By the way, did you know that no country in the history of the world has shed more blood for the gospel than France? That's bound to have an effect on you. Number three. Third thing that caused this difficulty in France is the French Revolution. We're fast forwarding to 1789 when the French Revolution broke out, fueled by the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and other philosophers. Actually, it's interesting, you know, I'm summarizing, of course, everything. The French citizens were, in fact, expressing their rejection of what they perceived as the cause of all the bad past. They looked back at religious wars of France, all this blood. I forgot to change the slide here. And they concluded, why? Why did that happen? Simple. The church and the kings. That was the problem. It's religion. It's all these Protestants and Catholics killing each other. Get rid of them, you're good to go. I mean, it's actually super logical, right? So, you got invented this thing called the guillotine. Louis, Louis the, 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 the 14th, uh, Louis the 14th, Marie Antoinette, gone. Oh, Louis the 16th, I'm sorry, Marie Antoinette, gone. No, no. Just got confused. Louis the 14th, no, Louis the 16th, and Marie Antoinette got confused, right? They got beheaded. Then they beheaded thousands of people, including nobles and priests, those who represented the corruption in the church. They even, this is interesting, they erected a large statue called the Goddess of Reason, and they placed it in Notre Dame Cathedral. So what are they saying? No, 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 not religion, reason. That is what it's all about. Well, guess what? Humanism is born. Humanism puts man in the place of God. One deceased contemporary politician, Senator Levalier, defined humanism like this, quote, humanism is the worship of all that is in man because man is in everything. Mm. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty clear. You see, from that moment on, everything was centered on man and on his reason. So what's France known for? Think about it. Perfume, food restaurants, fashion, beautiful women, beautiful places, sex, all that is man, humans. That leads to the fourth reason for the demise of Reformation. 
is liberal theology. Liberal theology, despite the religious problems of the past, despite all that we've just seen, it is true that up to the 18th century, the Bible was generally accepted as the revealed, true, and erring word of God. Though obviously, a lot of people had different interpretations, but the source was considered true and reliable. But there was a new climate born in the 19th century, rationalism, where everything now had to be questioned. The thinking at its inception in the movement called the Enlightenment, emphasizing reason and individualism rather than tradition. And it all came to a head, this is interesting, in the 1800s, when a German scholar by the name of Julius Wellhausen, along with other rationalistic theologians, turned the general accepted view all around. David Brees, in his excellent book called The Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave, great book, says that the turning point was the publication of Wellhausen's book in 1878 called Prolegomena and the History of Israel, where Wellhausen questioned the nature of the revelation of God in the Bible. Wellhausen held that instead of the Bible being dependable, it was human reason that was dependable. He birthed what is called the documentary hypothesis or the EJPD theory, arguing that the Torah or the Pentateuch had its origins not in Moses, but four independent authors. Okay, we're thinking, is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because the Pentateuch says 32 times that Moses wrote it. Well, the damage had been done. David Bree says this, quote, from that point, the advent of anti-revelational liberalism, Christianity ceased to be a religion based on divine revelation, but rather became a set of composite religious views anchored in human reason. Revelation was doubted and then denied and rationalism took its place. This defection from orthodox view of scripture was the evisceration of Christianity, leaving it a mere religion without life, without hope, without authority. Listen, quickly, the schools, the seminaries, the colleges, the universities, and then the state churches embraced this point of view. In essence, man became God through his intellectual pride. The reality of God and his word were brushed aside, being intellectually impossible. Even so, religion continued in Europe. There were still large churches, burning candles, beautiful choirs, lovely stained glass windows, congregations. What was gone? was a spiritual life. The Bible was now empty pages, written by dead men, with no truth, no reliability. So leaders quoted everything but the Bible and preached everything but the gospel. So Breeze concludes, Europe, in fact, lost its soul. And to this very hour, it is stir still in search of that soul. When I first got to Geneva uh, 24 years ago, my mom was a journalist there at the UN. So she said, you want to meet the current pastor of St. Peter's Cathedral? His name was Dr. Babel. I said, yeah. She says, okay, you'll meet for them for 30 minutes. He'll talk for 20. Then you can ask him one question, just one. <clears throat> for like weeks, I thought about what question I'd ask him. So we had a meeting, he talked for 20 minutes. He said, so young man, what is your question? I said, sir, here's my question. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? This was his answer. Yes, spiritually. No, physically. Welcome to liberalism. And he was the pastor in Calvin's pulpit. So, Maybe that's why France is still considered today the graveyard of missionaries. It's a tough battle trying to preach the gospel to this world, to this world. So, now that we're all depressed, okay? <laughs> What's the solution? Is there a solution? The resurgence of the Reformation. I would like to suggest a three-pronged solution to see the Reformation resurge in France and Europe. <coughs> Very simple. Number one, persistence. Take your Bibles. I told you we'd go to the Bible, okay? Luke chapter one. Probably not used to thinking about Luke chapter one as a missions text. Oh, it is. 
Let me show you this. Luke chapter 1. Okay? And I'm going to read it. Verse 1. Luke 1.1. 1, 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Very interesting verses. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He was a medical missionary, traveled with Paul on his journeys. His main job seemed to have been to provide medical help when needed, be an encourager. But Luke was something else than a doctor and something that many failed to consider. Luke was actually an evangelist. In verse 3, we find out that Luke is actually writing to a friend whose name is Theophilus. We don't know much about Theophilus. There are several theories about this precise identity. The name Theophilus really means loved of God, but carries the idea of friend of God. So most people believe that Theophilus was one of, of, of four possibilities, okay? We don't know actually what he was, but most think he was a Roman high-ranking official. Luke addresses him as most excellent Theophilus, which is a title often used when referring to someone to honor or rank such as a Roman official. Paul used the same term when addressing Felix in Acts 23-26 and Festus in Acts 26-25, most excellent. So that's what most people conclude, probably some kind of high-ranking Roman official. Some think he was wealthy and influential man in the city of Antioch. Others that he might have been the Jewish high priest named Theophilus ben Ananus in 37-41. And others even think he was a Roman lawyer who defended Paul during his trial in Rome. Okay, we don't actually know, so those possibilities may be there. But it does seem most likely that Theophilus was a high-ranking or influential Roman Gentile whom Luke wanted to provide a detailed historical account of Christ and the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. So Luke's intention for writing is very clear. He states his reason. He says that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Verse 4. His intention was to give Theophilus certainty about things he'd been taught. He wanted him to know that they were true and trustworthy. So I see three traits here in Luke that make him a great evangelist. Okay. Now we don't know if actually if Theophilus is a non-believer or a believer. We don't actually know that. It's very well possible he is an unbeliever. He's heard a lot of stuff, but he hasn't learned enough. Number one, he had the commitment of an evangelist, the commitment of an evangelist. He says, um, in verse 3, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. Wow. I mean, just imagine, how do you investigate today? You want something? Wikipedia, boom, get it. How do you investigate in the day of Paul? I mean, that implies going, traveling, interviewing people, researching, cross-checking. I mean, wow, that sounds complicated when you don't have laptops and phones and all the incredible, you know, resources we have today. But that's what he did. So he took time and diligence and hard work. And once the research was done, we find out that he wrote it out in consecutive order. So he wanted a chronological, clear, detailed order of facts. He was a doctor. He loved detail. And that's commitment, folks. Number two, he had compassion. Why was he doing this? For a friend. His name was Theophilus. He knew something of Christ, apparently. He knew something of the gospel, but apparently not enough. And that broke Luke's heart. And he thought, hey, wait a minute. This guy needs more info. He, he, he needs more critical information to be able to make maybe a, a decision for Christ. The point here is that Luke was motivated by his friendship to this guy. What compassion. And number three, you had the compulsion of an evangelist. Verse four, so that you might know the exact truths about the things you have been taught. I basically have already talked about that. So what does Luke do? Out of compassion, commitment, and compulsion, what does he do? So he sits down, researches, writes 
the entire Gospel of Luke, 24 chapters. That's not all. Go with me to Acts 1 and verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day, and etc. So what we find out is that Luke wrote Theophilus, not only the Gospel of Luke, but also the book of Acts. Why am I telling you all this? Okay, listen, this is my point. I'm going to tell you to you now. I hope you never forget this. Did you realize that one third, Luke and Acts together, one third of the entire New Testament was written to convince one man of the truth? One third of the entire New Testament for one guy. The, the, the day I realized that, it just blew my mind. I just thought, why are we talking numbers in the ministry? Where did that come from? And you know what? We don't even know what happened to Theophilus. It doesn't matter. That's not even the issue here. That's God's problem, right? Yeah. God opens hearts, Luke 16. All we have here is the man's total commitment for one guy. I just love that. You know why I love that so much? Welcome to France. Welcome to Europe. It's just a ton of work for a few people that come to Christ sometimes. See, Europe could be very easily represented by Theophilus. The Europeans, oh, they've heard this stuff. They've heard it, you know, they got churches everywhere and they, they can tell you about Jesus and they can tell you about a bunch of stuff, you know, probably the add things they know about Mary and they know about saints and all, they, they, they know stuff. They don't know it at all. So they need someone who will come there and just take the time to explain it. That's really cool, isn't it? So that's the first thing we need to do. First thing we need to do. So there was the point there. Persistence. Number two, understanding. This is so interesting, guys. In Matthew 9, 35, we, we need to understand something about evangelism. I'm going to go fast here, okay? I've got, I've got, to, got to go fast. Mm -hmm. I'll go really slow there, so I'm going to go fast now. Matthew 9.35 says that Jesus went about all the cities and the villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Luke 4.40 says, when the sun was settling, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. This is in Capernaum. Laid their hands on every one of them and healed them, and demons also came out of men. So, Actually, Jesus at Capernaum, at one point at least, healed everybody in town. What's interesting is that Jesus made his base of operations at Capernaum, spent three years there, preached most of his sermons there, did most of his miracles in the area there. You get to chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, mind-blowing verse, and it says this, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Folks, this is stunning. Jesus says that the people of Capernaum, who had much greater opportunity to embrace Christ, who had seen most of his miracles, heard most of his sermons, would be judged in Hades. He's saying you guys are being judged to hell more severely than Sodom. Folks, Jania, Jania, Jesus spent three years in Capernaum. This is the son of God. He's doing miracles, preaching sermons, and he condemns the city to hell for unbelief. Here's a, here's a trick question. Was Jesus a successful evangelist? That's kind of a trick question. I mean, there wasn't a lot of results to show for. Well, it's 
successful evangelism is apparently something more than just numbers and people coming to Christ, bearing fruit. Oh, that's our desired result. I mean, Paul said, hey, I want to come and bear fruit, talking about evangelism to, to the Romans, he said that. That's our great desire. That's been our desire for 34 years of ministry. But what's successful evangelism? It is proclaiming the truth so that those who hear the truth are put before the truth. Repent. Come to Christ. Go to heaven. Don't repent. Go to hell. That's the bottom line. We put them before that truth. God takes care of hearts. That's the example of Jesus here. So I think we've got to remember very, very, very carefully what the purpose of evangelism. You know, we want, I, I want a big church. I mean, I come here, I, I know, I, I'm going, I mean, I, every time I come here, I walk in, I break the 10th commandment, and then I confess. I covet, I do, I covet this church. I just walked up here with my son and I said, this building is like so gorgeous. It's like jealousy, confess, confess, confess. I'm going back, you know, it's different over there. It's like really different, okay? <laughs> But it's okay. It's not about that. Praise the Lord what the Lord's doing here. Praise the Lord. You guys are a great encouragement for us to keep going and to see the Lord work. So we got to understand evangelism, you see. And third, and this is it's really fun. I've got three minutes. Perfect. Third one is joy. Joy. You're going, what? Oh, yeah. Because sometimes God does give you fruit. And when you see that fruit, oh, baby, I mean, you are so excited. But you got to hang in there. You got to long and hard. So I'd like to show you a really cool PowerPoint. It's about three minutes long. Okay. And I'm going to prove to you that it's worth going to hard places like Geneva. Keep going. Church planning in Geneva, Switzerland. Ready for this? Here's Geneva. Not quite that big in reality, okay? That's Geneva. Right there, surrounded by friends. That's the beautiful city of Geneva. Hope you come. About a half a million people, small, but the United Nations there. It's on the map. World renowned. Beautiful city. Bring a lot of money. Super expensive. Big Mac meals, $13. Take a family of five. You can do the math. Okay? That's the cheapest restaurant in town. Okay, but it's good. There's Geneva. That's my rendition of Geneva. We have Geneva, France all around, and then the lake, and that thing is a fountain. We have a big fountain. That's kind of like our Eiffel Tower there. So I pastored this church for 11 years. It's called the Summit Church, okay? And it's part of a little denomination called EB Churches. It's right in the center of Geneva. And um, the blue dots in the next slides are daughter and granddaughter churches, all spawned from the mother church over a 20-year period. So when I got there, there were all these two daughter churches already planted, Ona and Minyi, in Geneva. I got there, and then for the next 11 years, we had the privilege of seeing Annecy start. We sent people, got missionaries, Annecy started a great church today, super church. Then we started Ville Grande, neighboring France, different side of town. Great church also, just doing really well. Then they started our granddaughter church, Bonneville. We brought in missionaries. I mean, you, know, you do it the way you can, right? And then we left after 11 years. I left the Summit Church to start a new church called the EIG, L'Église Évangélique Internationale de Genève. Let me show you a couple of pictures. That's the name of it, the International Church of Geneva. EIG is our website. It's all in French. That, whoops, that is our building. <laughs> Actually, it's true. We meet in the VIP. Whoa, this is true. This is going by itself now, okay? So this is the, we meet in the VIP center which is right there uh, on the corner of the soccer stadium. If you're inside looking out, boom, that's what you see. So that's actually John MacArthur. And you can see the stadium, 35,000 stadium behind there. So that gives us vision. That's what it looks like when you're inside with no people. Okay. So what it looks like with people, there it is with people. Okay? So that's pretty cool. So that's the EIG church. And then we started the X bottom left. And then they started Nedon. And then they started Duvet. So there is the church plants from the mother church. Now let's add up the numbers. 1990 to 20, about, okay? So now, now, now check this out. That's actually 30 years, okay? 
1990, 170 people in the mother church. Be feeling pretty good for a European church. 10 years later, you're the pastor of that church. You're going, eh, no growth in 10 years, still 170, bummer. No, 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 wait, look. If you add the, the, the daughter churches, 60, 50, 310, actually, we've almost doubled. Okay, actually, it's 10 years, I got the, the dates wrong. 10 years later, oh, no, the mother church just shrank. So now you're feeling really depressed to be the pastor. Stop. No, 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 don't get depressed. Look what the Lord's doing. Une, 50 people. Many, 80 people. Villa Grand, 130 people. NSC, 150 people. Bonneville, 60 people. EIG, that's our church, 130 people. X, 60 people. Nedon, 60 people. Duvan, 30 people. Grand total, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready? 880 people through church plants. I say, praise the Lord. That is like so cool. What's the conclusion? Church planning works. Church planning works. I mean, it just really does. Just do the math. Welcome to the slow yet very real resurgence of the Reformation as thousands of evangelical churches continue to be spawned in the same way all over Europe. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for praying for us as we turn our current church over to a new pastor by next year and consider the idea of starting a new, maybe English-speaking Bible church in Geneva. We're just kind of thinking through that right now. That's my wife, Meg. And uh, we think, well, that kind of fast. Okay, it's going to be really beautiful. So I'm just going to keep that on a second, okay? That's hers, Meg, Margaret, really sweet, great. And that's, uh, if you want to get our newsletter, it's John Glass in Geneva. Really complicated to remember. John Glass in Geneva at gmail.com. We'd be glad to send you that. And then also, this is the book. I want to show you this. This is really cool because this came out two days ago. There it is. This is uh, the Reformation tours I do. It's called John Calvin's Geneva Walking Guide. I only have one copy. I'm sorry, but you can go on Amazon. It's actually, you can buy it. I think I checked. I, I thought there were four copies, but actually only two uh, so far sold. That's because it just started yesterday. Okay. But it's really cool. So this is the, the book. And finally, the last thing I want to tell you, and then I'll let you go. If you would like, um, I can find this. Yes. If you'd like our newsletter, you're welcome to also sign this if you like. And I even have, since I'm a missionary, prayer cards. Okay, right here. So thank you so much for your patience. Let's go ahead and pray. And uh, Dr. Luther, would you mind praying since uh, you're here? And I'm just really honored by your presence. So let's have Dr. Luther thank pray you. and thank the Lord for this. I want to make one sentence first. When Luke wrote, he had no idea that 2,000 years later, we'd still be reading his writings. God does a lot more through you than you will ever know. And I could preach that, but I'm going to pray. Amen. Father, thank you for what you've done through John and his wife, and thank you for the fact that the gospel still works and faithfulness has its rewards. So teach us, we pray, and help us to be faithful all the way to the finish line in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for your patience. Thank you, everybody. I'll put the newsletter thing here and her cards here too. For and don't steal the book. I'm coming after you. Thanks, John. I